Hi, hello, what's up? Welcome back. Welcome, new friends. This is More or Less with Jess, a music and mental health podcast centered around one question. How are you really feeling, more or less? I'm excited to kick season three off with a very special guest, multi-platinum Grammy-nominated singer-songwriter J.P. Sachs. On this episode, J.P. unpacks vulnerability with me following his latest releases, When You Think of Me and The Good Parts. Since we recorded this, J.P. has dropped a new single, Moderation, alongside artist Camilo. J.P. is one of my favorite artists, and I'm so excited for y'all to hear more of our conversation. Season three of More or Less is sponsored by Neuro, enhancing your mind and body one piece at a time. Living in New York City, I spend way too much time and money on coffee and energy drinks, daily supplements, and then splurging on self-care products. Neuro creates supplements that fit your lifestyle instead of the other way around, with nutrients that enhance your health and wellness to something intrinsically convenient, affordable, and portable. With thoughtfully curated ingredients and lab-approved integrity, Neuro has changed the caffeine game for me since the gum is delicious and the mints leave me feeling fresh and focused. Neuro is always by your side when you need it. Take my word for it and head to getneuro.com now. We're here with J.P. Sachs. Good Thanks morning. for having me. Take yeah. two. So on the show, we allow our guests to introduce themselves. So please do the honors. To the camera? Yeah, to the camera, to the listeners. People might listen on audio. But... Oh, yeah. Right. Podcast. Yeah, podcast. Audio forum. Um, hello, my name is J.P. Sachs. Um, talk about my feelings a lot. I put them in songs, play instruments while I do it. They're kind of rambly, but I try and be sincere about it. And yeah, that's what I got. That's nice. how I'm going to summarize myself today. Yeah. I feel like it's those like Instagram bios or Twitter bios, or it's like in 140 characters. Like, how do you describe it? Changed mine recently. To what? I decided I didn't want to be, f- I didn't want to be fully summed up by my most recent single release. I felt like the good parts out now was just felt minimizing because mm. I'm more than my most recent output. I feel like that's basically this podcast in a nutshell. I'm jumping, too. I'm I, jumping right into identity you're doing and the mental work health. For me. There you go. Here's your segue. Um, wait. So, was it? What is your bio now? What did I change it to? I did it very impulsively. My phone's over there. Otherwise, I'd look at it. I have, I have this present blessing slash problem, um, where I feel like really in every moment I'm in. Which is beautiful because, like, it's nice to be present. Yeah. But occasionally, slash most of the time, it's also challenging because I don't feel like anything has ever existed or will exist other than the current moment. So if I'm feeling great, everything's great. But if I'm feeling like shit, it's like, oh, I've always – it feels like I've always felt like shit and always will feel like shit. Yeah. Um, so I'm bringing this back to the Instagram bio because there was a moment where I felt like that was who I was in that moment and I changed my bio and now I can't even remember what that was. I can't even remember what that it's conviction looked like. a fleeting moment. Yeah. I mean, well, what is making art other than uh, immortalizing fleeting moments? Right, right. Not that anyone wants to know, but mine is a pleasure to have in class because that was my report card for my entire life. Sounds like you're living in the past. (laughs) Very nostalgic. That's why I listen to your music. Yeah. I I used to like, I I think there's there's a degree of nostalgia that's really beautiful and makes life more full. And then there's, I think, a degree of nostalgia that ruins everything. Yeah. I'm always trying to find that happy medium. It's a barometer. It's a sliding scale. Yeah, luckily being in school was unpleasant for me, so I don't um, romanticize my nostalgia for high school. Right. I was not a pleasure to have in class. Were you? Was I actually? Did a teacher pleasure? say that? Was yeah. that like on a report? Oh yeah, card? It, was not, it was a joke in my family. Like pleasure I was a class. pleasure to have in class. For every teacher, you didn't like dislike any of them. I disliked them, but I I was able to you win them it? over. Yeah, yeah. Why would you have to win them over if you disliked them? Because you tr- we're trying because to impress the people that we dislike. I hate the word perfectionist, but that's very much who I was as a kid. Like mm. my adolescence was defined around wanting to be perfect and good at all the things. Mm. And that meant in the classroom needing to be superior. At what point did that, did you become self-aware of that dysfunction? Um, my first year as a freshman in college, my first week as a freshman in college, realizing that everyone in this room is probably going to have a 2.0 GPA. What does and, that mean? And we're all just going to end up in the same ether of the world that, you know, nothing is real and <laughs> we're all just here and grades don't really matter. Do you still, like, look to perfection in your life? I don't think so. Not as much. I think I've let it go. I, I think with COVID, that was a big wake-up call that I got to let that shit go because I'm just me and that doesn't have to be perfect. It's messy. 
Mm. I'm very messy. Just the mess is basically what I'm called. Just the mess. Yeah. You have so many little fun, little quirky things. More or less with Jess and just the mess. Just the mess, more or less with Jess. Yeah. Pleasure to have in class. Yeah. There's so it many little goes. catchphrases. Jess and a guest. You're built with built for public media. What can I say? <laughs> Here we are. But letting go of perfectionism is a real thing. Because it's not it's not based in reality. It's based in your head. I'm trying to get really, really good at letting go of perfectionism. I'm trying to actually conquer it. Perfect it, one might say. Perfect the perfectionism. No, perfect the letting go of perfectionism. I want to let go of perfectionism go. and accept that any given moment is what it's supposed to be as it is perfectly. Yeah. I want to be perfect at it. Yeah. And I think it's hard working in this business, uh, working in music and you being an artist. There's constantly a bar that is set to be a certain thing or to produce a certain thing. And... Um, I think the best art or the best work is usually ones that have flaws that everything can always be improved, right? Like there's always room for growth and it, anything that's perfect, people can see right through it. It's bullshit. I, I think I agree. But that takes time to convince yourself of, I think. Yeah, I think I agree because everything can be improved, but it can be improved by a future version of you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes like current version of you has done the best thing they could have possibly done. Yes. Could future of you improve it? Probably always. Future you could also make it worse. We said it the other day on a different podcast, but hindsight really is 2020. It's, you know, you look back and then you see all the things that you could have done, but there's a reason it's in your past. I like 70% agree with that one also, because I think like n nostalgia fucks up hindsight. Mm. Nostalgia is like hindsight is blurry to me. I'm not sure I can look accurately at the past at all. I think I look inaccurately at the past, equate my vision of the past to something real, and then compare my current life to an entirely fucked up version of my memory. Because you're clinging to that? Well, I'm clinging to a version of it that is inaccurate because we can't ever remember something exactly as it is. So you can look back at something and think, well, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. Yeah. But you're never remember exactly how something feels or how something looks because you're looking at it from a different angle. And I don't think that is necessarily always accurate. Yeah. Because there's many different perspectives to one particular situation or one moment. Totally. Everyone, I mean, New York is a perfect example of that. <laughs> Everyone is on the street with different places of where they need to be, different struggles they're dealing with. And we think that we are the main character most of the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we are in our own lives. In our lives. If you don't see yourself as the main character in your own life. Yeah. You're probably doing something wrong. Right. Like, I mean, whose story are you trying to be in other than your own? You can be right. periphery characters in other people's stories. And I think having a healthy recognition of when you are a character in someone else's life and when you are a character in your own and being able to hold those simultaneously is healthy. I think if you do too much of one or the other, if you do too much of only seeing your life from your own lens, or if you do too much of only seeing your life through how you or part of other people's and, lives yeah. or how you are there for others. I think either one of those in excess is probably a problem. Yeah. It goes back to that barometer. You're just constantly trying to find balance in all kinds of areas. Amen to that. Namaste. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently it's pronounced namaste. Get out. Yeah. I've been saying it wrong. We <gasps> as in like. Society. N not Indian. People who don't speak Indian are not Indian. We've all been saying it wrong. Namaste. Well, you know. More you know. And here yeah. I was thinking I was going to get certified in yoga this year. Well, now you can say namaste, right, when you do your yoga classes. Oh, my God. Well, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> on the show, we ask one main question, which is, in this moment, how are you feeling, more or less? I'm so sleepy, but I'm, like, sleepy in a peaceful way. Okay. Like, a peaceful sleepy. You know, like, there's a... I think there's a point in sleepiness where you don't want to not be sleepy anymore and then you get anxious because usually whenever I try and turn a feeling into another feeling, I don't actually turn it into that feeling. I just turn the feeling into anxiety. Ooh. So I'm sleepy, but I'm okay with it. But not like spiraling sleepy. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I have to, you know, be articulate or eloquent <laughs> or speak to anyone in a public forum that requires me to have access to my personality. Like this is recording. <laughs> <laughs> and we always follow up with what do you need more of and what do you need less of? Sleep. More sleep. Uh-huh. Yeah. Less. What do I need less of? Probably the internet. Mm. On your phone a lot? Yeah. It's just so stimulating. Yeah. There's so much happening in there. I know. It's like you pick it up. It's like a roulette. Like, will someone say a nice thing or will someone say a mean thing? Do you but ever look at your... There's a 98% chance they'll say a nice thing. So as someone who is um, both enjoys stimulus 
in compliments, the internet is a very appealing place to exist. Unfortunately, existing there often means not existing in my life, which is bad news bears. Well, it goes back to like being present. You're not fully present if you're in the world of your phone. Being present when I'm with other people is far easier than being present when I'm alone. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It goes back to like not having your phones at the dinner table and when you're out with people, like trying to avoid looking at your phone. And then when you're at home, that's the natural instinct to do. Yeah, I don't have trouble. Like I, I don't have trouble with my phone when I'm with others because I like others. Yeah. But in enjoying talking to myself as much as I enjoy talking to other people is uh, harder because I say nicer things to other people than I say to myself. We just argue in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot, a lot of thoughts going on in there. Yeah. But um, everyone's got good points. Do you look at your screen time at all? No, that's scary. I don't I'm not, look I'm not at trying either. to be that self-aware. No. There's a limit. Like, I, I just don't want to know. I definitely don't want to know. I'm also someone that has my notifications off. Well, also, I have my phone on Do Not Disturb at all hours of the day, which my parents really hate. I mean, you called me before I saw Do Not Disturb. <laughs> like, I have a lot of friends who do that, and I respect it. The reason I don't look at my screen time is because I'm not motivated by shame. Yeah. So if I looked at my screen time, I would try to be on my phone less because I was ashamed of how much I was on my phone. And I'd rather not look at my phone less because I'm trying to be more present in the world. I'd rather have a metric of here's your not here. I don't know what metric I would rather have. But I just know that that would make me feel shame. And shame very rarely helps me be better at my life. <sighs> Do you listen to Brene Brown? I'm obsessed with her. Exactly. You know where I'm going with this. She's on my album. I sample her on my album. Get out. Yeah. It's It's actually... I sample her quoting Jack Cornfield. <laughs> she goes, it's a podcast. She's talking about Jack Cornfield. She goes, I will love you. I will love you, but only if you will be the way I want you to be. <laughs> and I have that on an interlude in my album. <laughs> That's amazing. Does she yeah. know about it? Did you have to get the rights to that? We haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> I don't have to worry about that shit. I just make the art. We got business teams Someone for Someone else's job. Yeah, that's not my job. Like when I, I, sampled, um, I sampled Orson Welles. On my first EP, yeah, on a song called Twenty Five in Barcelona, there's Great song. thanks. There's this like mumbling in the post chorus, and it's a recording of Orson Welles reading War of the Worlds in the 1920s on the BBC. Have you heard this story? No, but I okay. So they did like a reading on the BBC of, of War of the Worlds, and people were tuning the BBC and thought it was real. <laughs> you have you heard this story? Yeah. So <laughs> happened uh, where you're from, New Jersey. Where? Close. In Jersey? It's it's hilarious. So people are like turning the radio, they hear the story about how the world's ending and they think it's real. They start freaking the fuck out. And it was just them reading the story on the BBC. Um, and so there are two reasons why I included on the song. One, I thought thinking the world was ending when it clearly wasn't was a great metaphor for heartbreak. Um, this is before if the world was ending. I was too. just going to say, so, ironically. <laughs> so I clearly have a propensity for the apocalypse. Um the other reason I liked it is when I wrote the song, I was in Barcelona with two of my best friends and they were watching interviews with Orson Welles. So on the voice note recording of me writing the song, you can hear Orson Welles talking in the background and I just thought it sounded cool. So then I started like listening to different things to see how I could incorporate that. And then I found an allegory and I'm a sucker for an allegory. Of course. And that got cleared. Yeah, I think they had to pay like a lot of money for it, which is, <laughs> that's, you know, that's why we signed to record labels. So we don't have to... I'm, I mean, actually, in fairness, if I wasn't signed to a record label, I just would have had it for free because right. I wouldn't have had to pay for it. And I'm not sure anyone would have ever come after me for it. Um, <laughs> but yes, now I've sampled Brene Brown. I will love you, but only if you will be the way I want you to be. She's talking about um, the difference between love and attachment. Right. And is that the theme for the upcoming album? The difference between love and attachment? I would say it's not the theme. But... Uh, but maybe, maybe if I were to intellectualize elements of it, that is present in a song or two. Mm. Yeah, I like that though. A song or two. Yeah, there's definitely some actively trying to distinguish in my brain between love and attachment in that album. One of the many feelings. Of there's all the so feelings. very many of them. That's why I don't know how to summarize it. Yeah. Yeah. For anyone listening, we're talking about JP's upcoming album, which is this year, potentially? For sure this year. 100%. Definitely this year. Mm -hmm. um, untitled, as of yet. Untitled. TBD. Yeah. I mean, I could just call it two, because this is my second album. And also, two means also. And that's like definitely a theme you of the album. Roman numeral, two. You get fancy with branding. See, my first album name was just so pretentious that I'm really trying to overcompensate here. Okay. 
Dangerous Levels of Introspection was the name of my first album. I think that's a fantastic title. It's so pretentious. It's a mouthful, but it's, I feel like that summarizes the body of work. Well, that's what I also feel. But I could have just called it like Rambly Ginger Talks About His Feelings and it also would have summarized (laughs) the body of work. No, I think that's fantastic. And that's that's one of the many reasons. Rambly Ginger Talks About His Feelings could be album two. Yeah. That's kind of funny. Rambly Ginger talks about his Felix. You could have like an acronym for it too. R G T A H F. Someone's going to hear this in their car. No, you should clip out just you doing that and put it on. That's the outro. That's the outro for the episode. More or less with JP. What was the first Rambly? I could make a good t shirt. It could. We'll definitely make t shirts. I've got a bunch of good t shirt ideas, I think. Okay. T-shirts are easier to make. If you need any help on that, I. (laughs) It's much easier to be creative about things that you don't think are connected to your identity. Ooh. It's much easier to make choices about things that you don't think are connected to your identity. Yeah. But I can understand the pressure of naming an album because that is going to follow you for the rest of your career. Right. It becomes part of my identity. T-shirts don't feel like they're part of my identity, so I'd be creative. Yeah. I think it's a trap some of the time to make choices thinking about like, well, what does this mean about me to make this choice? makes it way harder to make a choice about food, about, about how we spend our days, about where we go to school, about who we hang out with, about who we date. Mm -hmm. Imagine if, you know, if you just date someone because you love them, that's the ideal scenario. You know, a lot of people out here like, you know, choosing, you know, their friend orders the chicken parmesan, but they don't, so they don't order the chicken parmesan because they want to have, you know, their own unique order. And now they've made a decision. And they want to talk about how is yours, but how is yours? Yeah. So now you've made an identity choice that's kept you from pleasure. This is a tangent and has nothing to do with We're my We're hitting album, dangerous levels of introspection. Well, you see, that's the problem with that <laughs> title is it is accurate to the way I navigate the world. But it makes me feel like an asshole. But that's what makes you you at the same being time. Being an asshole? No, not being an asshole. Occasionally. It, the way that you're able to go to a different place in vulnerability. Yeah. I just want to talk about it more colloquially. I like the word colloquial because I think it's inherently um, contradictory because the word colloquial is in itself it, yeah. not colloquial. I tend to say eloquent. Well, eloquent is the, op- is the opposite of colloquial. Right. Yeah. But I like to say Eloquent it. is an eloquent word. Yeah. Colloquial is not a colloquial no. word, which is fun for me because I like words. That could so be I a like title. When, they're, when they're bad at being themselves. The word colloquial is bad at being itself. Why can't that be the title? colloquial Mm -hmm. because it's still pretentious (laughs) that's what we're trying to get away from i want i want to i want people to consume my art without the use of a dictionary (laughs) that's the sound bite right there that's Uh listen to my art without a dictionary um amazing so one of my talking points on here is vulnerability Uh i just wrote the word vulnerability big fan yeah in favor as we've already talked about brene brown and the power of vulnerability smash yeah what is your (laughs) what is your definition of vulnerability my definition of vulnerability uh i don't know i I probably whatever whatever brene says in daring greatly (laughs) is probably a way better definition than i would give you i think most of the time people think i sound smart about relationships i'm just regurgitating something i've heard esther perel or brene brown say 90% 90% of the time, someone's like, oh, JP, that's a really good idea about relationships. And I'll just be like, totally. But it's just something Brene, Brene or Esther said. It's there. I'm obsessed with her too. I tend to do that. I'm the I'm like the therapist friend in my friend group mm-hmm. where I give like really good advice, but it's really the my therapist giving the advice to me and I don't take it. So then I just give it to someone else. That I mean, you're paying for it. something. Might as well right. use it. Right. I'm just the vessel of information mm-hmm. to other people. I haven't gone to my therapist in a while. I used to talk to her a lot. And I haven't seen her recently. Is that know. was that a choice, or was a, a subconscious choice? To I don't know. Not? I should probably ask my therapist about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not entirely sure why why I've uh, avoided it. I think there are times in my life where, like, I I'm so analytical. But occasionally, I like the idea of just existing. And whenever I um, like it's it's I have the same relationship with my journal. My life is more full. And more beautiful and more actualized and more grounded when I journal all the time. Mm-hmm. But when I journal all the time, I'm going about the world with things a, a little bit more figured out in my mind. I have things slightly m- more well organized and sorted. And occasionally it's just fun to be hectic. Yeah. And if I journal, it's harder to be hectic because 
if, if you figure it out too fast, sometimes you ruin the fun. Sometimes I, 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 um, I regret not being more reckless in my earlier youth. <laughs> like I didn't, because I'm still in my youth. I think I read somewhere recently that middle age starts at 35. No way. I don't know. It's probably on TikTok. Hypothetically, I read somewhere is now code. Oh yeah, for, I saw, I saw on TikTok. TikTok, which I think is really funny. Um, I don't. It, this may or may not be TikTok, but I'm 29 years old, so I'm in like upper youth, mm-hmm. <laughs> lower adulthood. <laughs> um, and like I didn't start drinking until I was 25. Really? Yeah. I wish I would have fucked up, but it was most more socially acceptable. Was that? If you don't mind me asking, was that also like when you turned 18 or 21, that was just not priority for you? I had an alcoholic parent. Okay. So I thought alcohol was evil Mm -hmm. because it made my mom like way worse of a human. Yeah. So I was like, fuck all that. Like, I'm not trying to. Also, it's like things your parents do are never cool. Right. For me. I mean, I also know I have a lot of friends who get into alcoholism very much because of their parents' alcoholism. It's genetic. Yeah. Yeah. But so, th- it also plays a role in family dynamics. Honestly, my parents had a really interesting approach <laughs> unintentionally to uh, steering me clear of substance abuse because my dad's a pothead and my mom was an alcoholic. So I was like, well, weed can't be cool because dad's doing it and alcohol can't be cool because mom's doing it. So I'm going to just be so a loser. You, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so interesting. So I say loser facetiously. I actually think sobriety is extraordinarily admirable. Yeah, listen, to each their own. Live your best life. No, no, they're better than us. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. More self control. I've gone to some AA meetings. They're better than us. Discipline. And I think it's seeing the world from a different lens that other people tend to not see. Yeah. You've got such a sense of community. I'm quite jealous. Well, sober bars are now a thing. Like they're popping up all over the place. I went to a non sober bar last night. A non sober? <laughs> Is that where you were at 5 a.m.? <laughs> well, I wasn't at the bar till 5 a.m., but. Yeah, I was up till 5 a.m. Yeah. It was fun. I went to New York. Yeah. Do do as one New Yorker does. Is that what the New Yorkers do? Saturday night? I mean, personally, no. But It was so much fun. I had a lot of fun. No regrets. So I was going to ask you a question based on previous vulnerability topics. I did not ask answer your vulnerability question. Well, online. I'm going to go deeper into it. Okay, ask me more. <laughs> so someone asked me the other night who was an artist, and they said... I don't want to go to therapy because I think it will mess up my art. I think they're right and wrong. I didn't know how to answer. Uh, I mean, because I understood it, right? Like, I got it on a surface level, but I'm also someone that's like, but you can learn a lot about yourself. Like you're saying, like, you can be analytical about yourself. Art's not about good ideas. Art's art. I I think it's a, a, a somewhat dangerous misconception that something being presented beautifully in a song means it's a positive idea. Some of my favorite art, horrible ideas because we're not looking to art to tell us how we should feel we're looking to art to tell us how we do feel and how we do feel is very rarely a good idea yeah we we so whoever said that to you you know has a bit of a point because art isn't supposed to be figured out it isn't supposed to be the right answer it isn't supposed to be the analyzed here's how you live your health life in a more healthy way it's more supposed to be like, yeah, yeah, you're fucked up. Same. Yeah. Here's a song about it. And that person was saying, I throw all my messed up feelings into my art. And I feel like if I know the reason why I messed up, the art won't be good. I think that person should have more confidence in their ability to, to create and not think that their capacity to to explore creatively and to navigate their emotions artistically is dependent on their dysfunction. I think it's more confident to think that you can have a healthy lifestyle and create art that is cognizant of both your healthy choices and your unhealthy ones because uh, that sounds like a recipe for for having a life that that is not as fulfilling because if you think you need to be dysfunctional to create art, you probably will. But I think I'm a better songwriter than requiring mess in order to be Mm. a songwriter i don't think and my response was more so i don't think they're opposing forces i don't think they're against each other but you can choose to frame i mean if you don't think you're good enough to make good art out of a healthy place then that's your own insecurity right right there's a lot of work to be done on that part we can still talk about fuck up fucked up things while trying to be less fucked up yeah 
Yeah. Songs about trying to be less fucked up. Because aren't we all trying songs. to navigate a fucked up world? My favorite like, example of art not supposed to be a good idea. It's a, no, this is a, my favorite example is loose terminology, but I'm going to take a left turn to get back to this thought. Uh, we had a boba making night at my home recently. As, as one does. Where we, um, we made it like from scratch and we were listening to a jazz playlist. And the song Rehab by Amy Winehouse came on. Jam. Of course. But also, she put out a song about not listening to people telling her to go to rehab very, very shortly before dying of a drug overdose. And we as a society are just like dancing around singing it at karaoke. Yep. There is a dark undertone to that song. Extraordinarily dark undertone. And yet, we just kind of... Ignore that and sing along and dance and have a good time. And the dark undertone of just that song is the best example of the music industry killing artists to me and then making money off of it. Um, Yomi, our lovely audio engineer that's in the studio, and I had a very fun conversation yesterday uh, around this topic, which is that in a, it's very dark and it's very true, but the music industry profits off of artists' pain uh, mm -hmm. without providing any support or resources and that's a lot of the work i do now for a living and i try to do this podcast where we talk mm -hmm. about our feelings and really check in uh because there's a billion examples the list goes on amy i mean before we started recording talking about elvis like there's iconic figures that we only wish had more time mm -hmm. um and their lives were cut short because they were struggling and we just watched yeah i mean to your question to like your point before about you know can you still make relatable art about our dysfunction as humans while trying to be more grounded, have more clarity, have more joy, have you know less that tortured soul 100%. thing going on? Starving artists. And still make meaningful art. And I think not only is that a yes, I think it's also just we have to because I don't want to choose between good art and a good life. I think yeah. I'm going to have both. I think we should have both. Yeah. And music will forever be a form of expression for the fans, the artists themselves, people that work in it. At the end of the day, we're all here because we love music and we find it as a cathartic piece of expression. And I think we all have to do better in checking in with each other and making sure we're okay. And I mean, there's a ton of songs on the radio where I listen to and I'm like, are they okay? Like, did somebody ask them if they're okay? Um, and we can talk about the good parts. Or if you're okay, you know, I want to ask you if you're okay because, the, like, <laughs> what do you mean that song is so lovely? I'm, I'm very much an empath, though. So many lovely feelings. I, I, like, I don't totally believe in zodiacs, but I'm a Pisces, and I've been told I'm very emotional. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just constantly I like want, Pisces. I just constantly want to like fix people and and help them. And I'm, I'm a I'm an almost Pisces. When's your birthday? March Are you March? 23rd. Yeah. I'm an Aries. I'm February 23rd. We're a month apart. That. Yeah. One of my best friend's birthday is February 23rd. <gasps> Emily. Do you know a song of mine called For Emily? Yes. Emily's yes. birthday is from February 23rd. <gasps> February 23rd. And then one of my other best friends, the father of my godchildren, is January 23rd. That's wild. He doesn't like when I call him the father of my godchildren. The father. Because <laughs> I think it's minimizing his role in the equation, but I think it's funny. <laughs> When did you become a father of the God? I'm a, I'm a godfather twice over. There's two of them, Matthew and Casey. We recently baptized Casey, which was one of my favorite experiences of the year because I had to take a Catholic baptism class and I am Jewish. Um, and I loved getting to tell the deacon that I was Jewish because I'm oh shit so we're doing we're doing this baptism class and there's the four of us and the deacon says why don't you all tell me about your relationship to catholicism because to him the function of a godfather is to center catholicism in the, the it, life yeah, of the yeah. child which obviously i'm gonna do um <laughs> so Duh, that's why they picked you precisely um so they're going around and, and i'm last and i'm just ready for this moment because like i know i'm what i'm about to I know what I'm about to say to the deacon, but the deacon doesn't know it's coming. So I look him dead in his eyes and I go, well, Deacon Michael, I'm Jewish. And he got all flustered and it was really funny. Um, and then Ryan was like, the father of my godchildren was like, is that going to be a problem? And the deacon's like, well, it's a, you know, it's a little non-traditional. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, the, Ryan goes like, but like, weren't you baptized? And I was like, yeah, like I have a godmother. I was baptized Episcopalian, but like my parents were kind of just covering their, ba their bases because I also have like this certificate blessing from the Pope. Um, so my, my parents were like trying to make me the life of pie kid 
Just I'm like, looking at George because he's the same way. He was baptized, but he calls himself Jewish because his mother, who didn't practice Judaism, I'm putting you on blast now to the public, um, but he will pick and choose. What, yeah, what whatever's he, convenient. <laughs> whatever. I, although I was bar mitzvahed. Really? Like, I, Okay, so you, you hit that. So yeah, baptized yeah, yeah. and then bar mitzvah. Well, my family doesn't know about me being baptized. But like they don't, they don't listen to this shit. Got it. My, my dad's family is all Jewish. My mom's family is all dead because they're Jewish. Because my mom's family was uh, God. <laughs> uh, Holocaust. Yeah. Hungarians, World War II. My grandfather was the one of the only one. He was the only one of his three brothers that weren't killed in a concentration camp. Holy Which God. is why I feel like owning my Judaism is important to me. Because like when your family is like killed for a thing, it's hard to be right. like, nah, that. Nah, I don't need that thing. So, like, regardless of what's happening in my life, like, being Jewish is a part of my identity that I hold proudly because I'm allowed to. And of I'm, course. Yeah. So I was bar mitzvahed. I don't eat pork. Mostly because pigs are cute. It's also because, like, because of Judaism, like, 10%, 90% because of the movie Charlotte's Web. <sighs> what's the name of the pig in Charlotte's Web? I always forget. He's so cute. Wilbur. Wilbur. What a cute name. Wilbur. I just always think of Wilbur when people eat bacon. Aww. I don't eat bacon. I don't tell them this because I don't want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to yuck their yum. And you don't want to be that guy, too. There's some people that are that guy. I'm not a yum yucker. Yeah, you're not that guy. I like the term yum yucker. That make a good t shirt, too. <laughs> make a good leading single. Bad album title, Yum Yucker. I feel like it could be a single. Yum Yucker? Yeah. What's it about? Follow up to okay. Justin Bieber's Yummy? You might be onto something. A remix. There's too many syllables to do on the same melody, and I'm not going to try. What would you make Yum Yucker about? I would make it about um, your relationship with pork. No, it's got to be a metaphor. <sighs> What's the emotional yum that you will emotionally yuck? <laughs> um, I think I would pick, uh, well, we were talking a little bit about like being cynical about awards, but also humble. Mm -hmm. That's kind of a yum yuck. You know, like, like if someone wins a Grammy and you're like, well, that should be me. Or Not you're pork. like, well, I hope you're enjoying that nepotism. <laughs> Like Nepo babies right now, like all that time. Yeah, what is that about? Um, I feel like I'm not qualified to be the person to like explain it to you because I I'm fully how, learning what it's about. Like, how much nepotism do you need to? Like, where's where's the line between nepotism and privilege? Or are they the same? At times. Well, nepotism is definitely a form of privilege, but not right. all privilege is nepotism. Yes. Yes. But like, I, how... uh, my take is that. People just woke up one day and chose something to complain about. Are we complaining? I thought we were just making fun of them. I think it's a little bit of both. Like you have rich parents. Ha ha. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a little bit of that. Of, And I think bitterness a lot of people have. Because the world is full of bitter at times. Yeah. That's my take though. I think parenting is like making TikTok videos. <laughs> The thing that'll make it work or not is sometimes like so small. You can change like one little detail and certain, suddenly one kid's going to Harvard and one kid's in rehab. That's really accurate. Just like, you know, you just post the same. <laughs> it's so funny. I'm clearly in a lot of marketing meetings. Sa same person, different font. Yeah. The same video. I, I just posted uh, a video of myself playing this song and I posted it actually playing it. And there's like a video of me playing mm -hmm. it. It got like 30,000 views. And I posted the exact same audio with me just like lip syncing in the dark in a bar. And it got 450,000 views in two days. So like the second video is the Harvard kid. Yeah. I don't yeah. actually equate success with academic um anything so that's like a strange metaphor we'll call it the happy kid the happy kid or like the fulfilled kid the good partner kid the, su the supportive member of his community kid <laughs> that shows up for his friends and is empathetic and has a a good relationship between well his masculinity lifestyle. and femininity yeah yeah then the kid who's um what would be a failure kid honestly to me a failure kid would just be a meanie i want to raise a meanie like a bully yeah bully yeah the kid that picks on other kids on the playground yeah. Yeah. That would suck. Yeah. To be that one. I don't know what I would do. Like if I had if I had a bully kid. Yeah. That's embarrassing. Punch him in the nose. I feel like that's really embarrassing though as a parent to to have a bully. Yeah. Yeah, but then sometimes like bullies character building. Like I have some friends who are probably bullies, but like they've repented. Yeah, you have friends who you're like if if we knew each other, 
when we were kids. Actually, that's probably not true. I can't think of any friends that I that were bullies. At least they haven't told me. I wonder who my most likely friend is to have been a bully. There's a game, like probably a card game. Probably the pretty game. ones. It's like, who's my most likely to? And I'm sure that's a card. Like, who's most likely to be the high school bully? I think it's harder to be a good person as when you're younger, when you're pretty. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I'm as, saying this. I'm as saying the this person is, that got bullied by the pretty kids. No, I'm saying it's harder that. to be a good person. Yeah, I'm telling you, they were the bullies. The pretty kids were the bullies. Yeah, but why? That's what I'm saying. But why? Because they can. Like, thank God I was like so deeply undesirable as a teenager. <laughs> because I had to like think to myself about shit and, you know, develop other ways to be accepted. Like if I had just like been accepted, like I probably never would have played the piano. That's good reframing. Hmm. That's a good like therapy skill. Reframing? Yeah. Sick. <laughs> I don't I don't even know what my first question was to you. Um, but I feel like we covered What's a lot of What's the definition of vulnerability? Yeah, definition of vulnerability. Trying I, to hold on to the good parts. No. I don't think that's vulnerability. I think that's uh um I think that's adamant idealism. Mm. <laughs> it's positive thinking though. It's a positive spin. It's trying. On a breakup. A critical word in the good parts is trying to hold on to the good parts. Yeah. Not actively succeeding at holding on to the good parts. <laughs> Attempting. Attempting. <laughs> songs are about often, I think songs move me more when they're about what we're trying to figure out, not, what, not about what we have figured out. Because everyone's trying to figure things out. Very few people have figured things out. And also, all I really have in terms of subject matter is what it feels like to be myself. And I'm just trying to accu accurately represent that in my art. Um, what are, since you brought up TikTok, because <laughs> I'm going back to I it. I hate myself for that. No, I, I think it's a... F this is a good quote for your mental health podcast. I hate myself for that. Someone write that down. <laughs> what a, whatever timestamp we're at. <laughs> Um, <laughs> what are the good parts of social media to you? Because I know we were talking about screen time. There are people on it. Yeah. I love people. People are my favorite thing about the world. They're also my least favorite thing about the world. But predominantly, they're my favorite thing about the world. Yeah. I really love people so much. People person. I think I like people slightly more than I like art. I think I like art because of its ability to bring me close to other people. I think people are amazing. Endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah. I've realized about this my words i realized this about myself at why well, i put maybe i realized this about myself before but i was able to articulate this realization to myself when i was like 22 and i went to the grand canyon with my mom and i remember everyone's looking at the grand canyon and being amazed because the grand canyon is amazing and i looked at it for like five seconds and i was like cool canyon and then i looked at all the people being amazed and i loved looking at all the people being amazed yeah and i found that every time i've been somewhere amazing in the world they're like i'll look at the world for a second and be like tight beautiful but then i just love people being in awe i love watching people being human i think it's the reason i love being an artist so much is i get to facilitate people feeling a little bit more feeling human. a feeling yeah i mean when a, when a song does its job it like it's like a little keyhole that gets you close to a part of yourself that maybe is hard to get to without it and i think that's one of the privileges and blessings of being an artist is that my job is to think about my emotions all the fucking time and most people don't get to think about their emotions all the time it doesn't mean they're less emotional it just means you know they have jobs to do my yeah. job is to articulate my emotions so i put in all that work think about what my emotions are and then i and then i come out with it with this little 3 minute window and then i give you that 3 minute window and then you get to look through it to a part of yourself with some added vocabulary to emotionally understand yourself with yeah that feels purposeful That's for so me. freaking cool. That's where my sense of purpose comes from. That's my why. No, I'm glad you said that. I like Because I think, A, it's important to articulate your why. And B, it brings about emotions in other people that you may not have known existed because you were writing it from your experience. But it hits different people differently. And I'm sure you've seen that touring the world and, you know, bringing people together. People are singing your lyrics because they can relate or they... It's such a cool feeling when that happens. Yeah. Um. To me, that's what, like, when I go to a show and I see that, that is what Be Amazed is to me. Yeah. It's also, like, it was a powerful realization to me to recognize that what m makes the music resonate isn't what makes me unique in any way. It's often more so just, like, what makes me basic. Hmm. It's just, 
it works because what I'm feeling isn't all that different from what anyone else is feeling. Like we're all just going through like eerily similar shit most of the time. Yeah. Like eerily. Like there are moments where I, I feel like I've been so specific in a song that no one will have possibly gone through the same thing. And I'll get all kinds of DMs be like, oh, damn, I was also in Barcelona right after I went through this breakup. <laughs> and I was like walking around wondering how to look at the world and not want to tell them about it. I was like, well, that's specific. Were they also turning 25? There's been varying degrees of birthdays. Post-travel yeah. breakup seems to be a thing. Um, but you put a a song to that feeling, which is what is Yeah, cool. and the, the good parts, I've gotten so many messages about that too. Because I just think there are there are slightly more songs about trying to destroy the memories that make you sad to recognize the beauty in. Yes. Yes. And I I would say that the good parts and when you think of me are a very unique perspective on a breakup that there isn't there's not enough conversations about it but there's not enough music about it um because it, i feel like the initial reaction to the breakup is the anger it's like the seven steps of grief it's like very similar that people when they break up they immediately want to be angry and hurt and channel that somewhere justifiably so yeah and it's very angering and hurtful to be broken up with 100%. So those feelings are valid. And then I think when you hear a song like yours, it brings about a a different emotion. It doesn't, you know, minimize the hurt. It just brings up an emotion that wow, I can look at the happy moments and how they shaped me as a person. If they're there. If they're there. They're not always there. Some people have genuinely shitty relationships that don't have too many good parts to look on that are not actually helpful to look back on. Yeah. You know. If it's abusive, deeply toxic, any number of things. Yeah. But I, in my personal opinion, think that love can be extraordinarily beautiful and important and valid and right and honest and also not endless, which is controversial yeah. for some. And I feel like I know the answer to this, but do you also believe, because I've been saying this for a while and it's something I believe, but do you believe that, um, I was going to start singing one of your What lyrics. doesn't last forever. Yeah, you heard, you heard, I really wasn't going there on purpose. <laughs> you could have. I, I know, been, I could have. It's fun. Um, you would have sang it better than my 10 a.m. <laughs> sleep voice. Do you believe that people come into our lives for reasons and rhyming seasons, but people are meant for certain parts of our lives that may not be forever mm -hmm. like there's a reason we meet every single human being that we do that comes into our lives for a certain duration yeah i do believe that i don't think that negates things being hard things being challenging things being fucked up well i think i'm not Entirely sure whether reason is inherent or reason is our responsibility to attribute to things. Mm. I think reason is possible, but I don't entirely know. Because I also think like we have a little bit of this like silver lining obsession when like sometimes things are just fucked up. Yeah, some things are just shit. Some things are just bad. And, and we have to sit in the shit at times. Yeah, and like sometimes... We don't have to be so obsessed with finding the silver lining or like learning from it. Sometimes bad shit just happens. But then other shit will also happen after that. And maybe we just think more about the other shit that happens after it. For me personally, sometimes like obsessing over the silver, like trying to find the silver linings can be, or like be always constantly being told that like you can find beauty and fucked up things that happen is like, I don't want to. Like, well, maybe, I don't know. No, but there's space for that. There's space to just let it be fucked up. You ever tell, so that. tell someone about something really bad that happened and they're immediate, like... They try to fix it. They, or they just, like, look for the silver lining or look for the thing to be learned. And, like, sometimes it's like, nah, like, it was just bad. But, like, now other stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there's always now other stuff. But it's choosing to sit in it? I don't know. Or... I'm not an authority on these things. I... <laughs> I actually have no fucking clue whether that's a good idea or not. It's just been like something I've I've pondered recently. My like favorite quote is nobody knows linings. what they're doing. 
Except Brene Brown and Esther Perel. Except Brene Brown. They know what yeah. they're doing. Esther knows. I, it, I, I really think Esther has figured it out. I listen to Jay Shetty a lot too. I think he has a good handle on on life. Mm -hmm. There are certain people that just they seem like they got it figured out. I know they have shit in their life, but they make me feel better about life. Mm -hmm. JP, I'm gonna segue to pretty much the end here. Um, what is one thing you've done this week to take care of yourself? I went for a walk yesterday, nice. and I bought I bought apple cider donuts at the farmers market. They were delicious. And I went to a bookstore. Yeah? Yeah. I always feel like a fraud when I go into bookstores. Because you don't read? I do. But like less than you would expect. Well, I don't know what you would expect. But like especially with my new cool glasses <laughs> and like the whole like I'm a writer thing. You look very New York right now. Thanks. For our friends that are listening on audio, JP looks very New York today. I've I'm a, I'm a chameleon, a poser. I've acclimatized. I'm I mean from the East Coast. I'm from Toronto. Yeah, it's New York adjacent. You get it. We're like New York, but better than you. <gasps> um, you can put that in the tidbit too. I am gonna Canada put that is in. like better America. Everyone knows that. I need like a little meow meow meow. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm American too. I really like to have it both ways on this because I um. I have an American passport. I just learned this about you. Yeah, like my mom was American. So I have all of the perks and benefits of having an American passport, but all of the perks and benefits of being pretentious about being Canadian. Like I can I can have both the higher the moral high ground of my Canadian identity yeah. and the pragmatic convenience of my American passport. And I I have it both ways. And I rub it in your face. Well, it goes back to the religion thing too. Which religion? Oh, the multiple yeah. religions? Yeah. yeah. I'm like yeah, I got it covered. <laughs> you really are a chameleon. I'm trying so hard to be bilingual. Yeah. Trying so hard. I really, really wanted to be fully bilingual before I turned 30. And I'm not sure I'm going to like get all the way there. But when I'm drunk enough, I am able to access a part of my brain that speaks Spanish. I can speak Spanish when I'm sober also, but like I can really do it when I'm drunk. Or I think I can. I'm not entirely sure. So when you're in the Dominican, will you be speaking Spanish? Or are you going to brush up on it? I won't – I'm not sure how many Dominicans I will be around. I'm I'm working on an album with Venezuelan artists. Oh, okay. Um, well, they're Venezuelan, but they're also Argentinian. Their identity it confuses <laughs> me a tad. Um, I, well, I mean, I spent a lot of 2022 in Latin America. Yeah. Because I wrote my album in Colombia, twice in Argentina. You were doing shows down there too, right? Yes. Yeah. I did do some shows down there. I really love it there. Would you ever move there? Yes. Now I would move there. Is now. that on the bucket list? I mean, no, I will do that. I mean, I. how long do you think you need to be in a place before it's like I lived there for a sec? Mm, six months maybe? Okay, then I have not lived there. I wonder if accumulatively I was in South America for six months this year. No, maybe three, maybe three. Yeah, three months? Yeah. It's like studying abroad. Yeah, I did take Spanish classes every morning. I would wake up, I would go to my Spanish class, and then I would go to the studio and I would write songs. And I do think training my brain to think in a different language did absolutely impact the way I write in English. Because you just have to come at words from a different angle when you're trying to communicate with far less vocabulary. Yeah. And in English, I speak like a weirdo. So when I was hanging out with people who didn't speak any English and I had to communicate myself and I had only so many words to try and say something in Spanish, I would have to like think of different angles to get to the point I was trying to make with my very limited vocabulary. And that changed the way I think in English because you can do the same exercise like how can i say that it's like a mental game of tetris how simple can i make this thought i'm saying without diluting the thought which is a fun question for a songwriter yeah interesting, Very interesting. i love language because i love humans and i love communicating with humans and i love expression and it's all connected jp you're such an interesting human thanks i have you i'm, I'm always torn when people ask me about a superpower because i think there's i have a right answer and i have a answer i want do you want to give me the answer you want? The answer I want is to speak every language. Okay. Because like that'd be super tight. Like of all of them. Like even like the ones that 200 people speak. The, I think the right answer to superpower is healing. I just think that's – I, I just have yet to hear an argument for a superpower being better than healing. Like hmm. someone's dying, you can just fix them. <sighs> Yeah. Now, people have pointed out to me that, like, yes, but if healing was your superpower, if you spent a day outside of the children's hospital 
what an asshole. So maybe it's too much right. responsibility. But if you can fly and you're not like flying your friends to Santa Barbara, well, maybe you're also an asshole. Yeah, there's degrees of it. Like anything. We keep coming back to this. That's, we keep that coming is, back to that this. That is idea. a reasonably <laughs> wide spectrum. Fly your friends to Santa Barbara, save dying children. But I think healing is just the. I, I've yet to hear an argument for a better superpower. People always choose flying or like levitation or, or the invisibility. One where you move shit with your brain. Yeah. I mean, invisibility I had for a really long time. So that one's not appealing to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest. But like healing, if you don't go to healing, like, Clearly not enough people have died around you. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to get into Reiki. Reiki's all healing and No, I mean real healing. <gasps> I love Reiki. <laughs> it's amazing how much you can do to someone's body by not touching them. No, I know. I are you're going when you say healing, I'm thinking like Jesus walking the earth, healing every single Well, yeah, person. it's a superpower. Yeah. I mean like you walk into a hospital room and Yeah. You're like cured. Cured. Next, yeah, <laughs> that'd be sick. And we just like automate healing. I'm sure there's so. I'm sure you can make a Black Mirror episode on why my theory here is flawed and would not work in actuality. But the good news is, this is hypothetical, and no one actually has superpowers. Where is Black except Mirror? Except for been? the people with Reiki superpowers. True. I've never done. Oh, Reiki. Speaking of Black I'm Mirror, trying. I haven't seen. I felt like COVID was a perfect time for them to like scare us with with a new season it just got too black mirror on its own the world was just covering the black mirror narrative. i think you're right i think that's why we haven't they were like nah, the world the reality has has taken over our it's plot far lines. more dark than tv i feel bad about my cynicism about reiki i actually think reiki is beautiful and i'm really trying to like shake all my cynicism because i think it's a lazy version of a personality i'm curious about reiki okay I'm next time in your, you're I'm in new curious. york we'll hook you up with a reiki healer does it work i was skeptical as well I'm not skeptical. I'm I'm trying to eliminate cynicism. I don't like it. It I should say I was skeptical. I think it wasn't that I was skeptical. It was that I I didn't fully understand it, and I I felt like I was supposed to feel a thing. Like there was a thing that I was supposed to achieve in doing it. Again, this idea of perfectionism that I have to like do the thing which it's meant for, and I didn't know what that was. And I think that's what hindered my first experience. I've done it maybe two or three times now after my first experience and I have seen colors and I have cool. felt I have felt Are you col- are you colorblind? No, but Do you, you not usually see colors? No. When you when your body What are you seeing in the room right now? Well, this room is purple and ironically I saw purple when I did Reiki. Oh, you mean colors like whether well, they're not usually there? Colors when your eyes are closed. Oh, okay, 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 okay. So your eyes are closed and someone is healing over your body um, and channeling different chakras and all the things. And I felt myself seeing purple, like purple flashes. That's cool. Which supposedly has a lot to do with how you process emotions. Like purple is the color of emotions. That's cool. Um, More so feminine emotions because everyone is... What's the, a feminine emotion? The theory is that we are all one half feminine, one half masculine, and different colors. 50 50? Yeah. And one and colors represent those sides of ourselves. Um, so purple is is one of the feminine colors, and your body is always a balance between uh, feminine emotions and masculine emotions. What's a masculine emotion? I guess like red. But ma- <laughs> masculine emotions are um actually top up and then feminine. I mean, TMI, but like women's body parts, feminine is your lower half Um, because women tend to feel things a lot in their stomach. That's just a normal thing. Whereas men feel a lot, a lot more tension in their shoulders, working out, muscle tension, all that good stuff. And that is the theory is that our bodies are half and half and we are constantly neglecting or leaning into one or the other. Huh. Yeah. So we'll 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 talk about Reiki next time you're here. Okay. Um, JP, what is a lyric or affirmation that keeps you moving forward? A lyric or affirmation that keeps me. Moving I feel like forward. we talked about this a lot today, but it's a typical more or less question. Um, I feel like I have go to quotes, but I don't remember them. I have a very bad memory. Like it could really be your bad. own lyric too. No, that would be so. <laughs> that would be so narcissistic. I am motivated by this lyric that I wrote myself. I mean, you wrote it for a reason. So, 
most of the things that I'm currently drawn to in my pursuit of self-betterment are regarding the morning. I'm trying to conquer the morning. Okay. We're doing it right now. We are doing it right now. Yeah. Real time. I'm really bad at the morning. I'm just like bad at giving a shit about myself when I first wake up. Fair. You know, like convincing myself that like waking up is a good idea just like takes a second unless I'm going to disappoint someone else because then it's like I'm waking up for someone else. Yeah. For example, waking up this morning was very easy because I couldn't miss this twice <laughs> because then I would disappoint people. But if I don't have anyone to wake up for, waking up is like just seems unnecessary. Um, so I'm trying to not feel that way first thing in the morning. And I've been reading all these books about like how to conquer the morning. Like see sunlight in the first five minutes. Don't look at your phone for an hour. Buy an alarm clock. You know, eat breakfast. Work out. You know, all those like basic. When you figure that out, let me know. Because I think I'm not a morning person either. Um, but the, like the famous line I use is five more minutes when I wake up. I just want five more minutes, which turns into I'm 10, so, I'm 15, so 20. I'm so bad at the morning. I re- that was my New Year's resolution. Conquer the morning. That's an it album title. My toes. That's an album title. Conquer the morning? No. That's good on a t-shirt, though. It may not be the title, but that's good on a t-shirt. If I open a gym, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, JP, thank you for conquering this morning with us. Thanks. That was a phenomenal the- segue. We did conquer this morning. Heck yeah, we did. It's wonder- a Sunday. We're going to I- take on the day. Because I feel I'm gonna I'm like in a good peaceful sleepy right now. I wonder at what time today I will start hating myself. I would say like two to three p.m. is the most likely scenario. Is that prime time? Like well, no. Usually window? I like two to three p.m., but usually I get more than three hours of sleep. Yeah. But we'll see. No, I told you two to three is usually my window for like the next boost of caffeine. I need to stay alive and function. Got it. Caffeine. Yeah. I mean, Maybe it's like, not a great solution. And then how many hours after that do you start drinking? Uh, it depends what day. Uh-huh. Depends what day or or vaping. I'm not. I I tend to be a more vaping. weed person. Yeah, I've done that one. I have asthma. It's weed. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> Got it. I, just, I live in New York. I feel like that's kind of <laughs> it's like a natural. Yeah. You have asthma. Yeah, so I can't smoke things. I like edibles, but only for sleeping. Yeah, yeah. And you live in California. They're pretty easily accessible. We got all kinds of substances out yeah, there. All, all kinds. All the things. Weed is old news recently. People are onto new things. Oh, I know. That, that's a podcast for a different day. <laughs> but on that note, thank you for being with us more or less. I love that we ended our mental health podcast interview on um, substance abuse and self-hatred. I know. Do we keep that in? <laughs> I feel like that's pretty authentic, right? Yeah. It's your podcast. Whatever feels right. I know. Did you choose the purple lighting because of the purple feminine colors from the Reiki or is it? No, a but that was, that was a great. That's a wrap on this week's episode of More or Less. Thanks for tuning in. And if you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with a friend, post about it. Give us a review on Spotify, Apple, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to stay updated on what's next for More or Less, please give us a follow at More or Less with Jess on Instagram, TikTok, all the social media things. Please take care of yourself and we'll catch you next time. More or less with Jess.